the Intel i7-7700K found its place in our bench this past week, tested in both the MSI Z270 Gaming Pro Carbon and Gigabyte Z270M7 motherboards. The i7-7700K runs a base clock of 4.2 GHz with turbo up to 4.5, while running on similar architecture to Skylake. The result is that gains are primarily derived from frequency, but changes to speed shift, cross point, and low level overclock tuning means there's a lot to consider. This Intel i7-7700K review is brought to you by Thermaltake's P3 case, a $100 enclosure that can be leveraged as a wall-mounted test bench. The P3 is easy to work on for enthusiasts who regularly change components. Click the link below for more information. Before an architecture overview, let's quickly go over the 7th generation KB Lake SKUs for the new family. There are 40 of them in total. That includes the Y, U, H, and S series CPUs. The most relevant ones, of course, are the i7-7700K and non-K the i5-7600K and the i3-7350K, which is a KSQ i3 that we'll be looking at hopefully late January. And in total, the TDP for all 40 SKUs ranges from 4.5 to 91 watts, so it is a pretty big range. And the most popular SKUs are those three that I mentioned, the K SKUs. Respectively, the 1,000 unit pricing for those CPUs will be $340 for the i7-7700K, $242 for the 7600K, and 168 for the 7350K. The 7700 non-K will be $303 and the cheapest i5 will be 65 watt TDP i5-7400 at $182. The cheapest relevant i3 is the i3-7100 at 117-1KU. We've put the three k SKU CPUs into a specs table here with focus on the 7700K. That's what we're reviewing today. That's a traditional 4-core, 8-thread CPU, but with a higher frequency than previously, this is at least partly achievable by refinement of the 14 nanometer process, something that Intel is now calling 14 nanometer plus. The physical changes are almost entirely at the fin level, with Intel widening the gate pitch and making fins taller, and this allows for increased frequency headroom and higher overclocking potential, somewhere around an extra 200 megahertz minimally for the stock shipping clock rates or upwards of about 400 megahertz. One of the most critical aspects of the KB Lake architecture is that the Intel CPUs are now leveraging speed shift in a more effective capacity, and that's primarily by increasing the frequency at which the clock rate can change in a given second, and it's up to 1,000 hertz now. So 1,000 times per second, the KB Lake CPUs can switch their frequency to a lower or higher value as needed depending on the workload. This means a few things. One, of course, is that you improve battery life in notebooks and things like that when you don't need to be running a higher clock rate for trivial tasks for the CPU to handle. The other is that you can get boosted performance when there are those really bursty high requirement periods of an increased clock to handle more instructions. And although we've asked Intel what the minimum granularity is for the clock switching at that 1000 hertz interval, I haven't heard back yet, but it does change at 1000 times per second, and that's bigger news for speed shift. Just like everyone else these days, Intel is now moving to better BCLK awareness by providing a volt frequency curve. That doesn't mean the motherboard manufacturers are leveraging that to the full potential, but they are adding a volt frequency curve, so voltage and frequency will adjust in step with one another. This is a step toward resolving some issues with the higher voltages than what's required, but motherboards are still dictating a large part of that, especially with BIOS on things like the Gigabyte board that we'll be reviewing shortly. The KB Lake boards we've tested so far do have large differences in thermal performance from one to the next with the same CPU, and the same clock rate just because the BIOS modifies what the running voltage is. For more architecture discussion, if that interests you, check the link in the description below to our full written review, which has all the block diagrams for the new chipsets, including the Z and H and B series chipsets, and some additional information on how the architecture has changed with KB Lake, and a lot of that is kind of a recap with Skylake, but you can learn more there. Let's get into the testing now. So first of all, a huge note, because we're doing a CPU review, it means that we're changing CPUs, which of course means we're changing platforms for a lot of those. As we change platforms, there might be requirements to change things like memory or the memory clock, especially as we get into older generations like Sandy Bridge. For all of the platforms and test benches, again, link in the description below if you're curious what memory frequency was used or what motherboard was used, things like that. And while we do want to add the i5 and the i3 and of course the Zen CPUs at some point when they are available for benchmarking, Today we're focusing on the i7s. Frankly, that was enough work to do for now with CES around the corner. 
uh, the i5 and i3 will be added shortly thereafter. For this truncated version of our thermal benchmarks for the i7-7700K, we're looking primarily at the performance difference that voltage can make. We tested using both the MSI Gaming Pro Carbon and Gigabyte RGB version of the M7 boards, each of which has a different auto configuration for voltage, and then we also threw in manual voltage tuning for a better understanding of the 7700K's temperatures compared to manually tuned 6700K CPUs. These tests used the Kraken X62 cooler, which was chosen so that we could monitor the temperature delta between the liquid, the actual cooling liquid in the tubes, and the CPU package. Note that all these tests use the same settings. EIST is off, turbo is off, frequency is set to 4.5 GHz fixed on all CPUs, and C states are off. Fan and pump speeds are at max settings, so 1800 RPM on two 140mm fans with a max pump RPM. For the first test, we're looking at the Gigabyte motherboard being tortured with four-year transforms for half an hour, and the i7-7700K is constantly in the 90C range, occasionally hitting 94. Ambient was 21 to 22C for all these tests, so you can do that calculation yourself if you want. And our temperature range is plus or minus 1C. This was the first board we tested, so the concern initially was that KB Lake would run way too hot because the same stock configuration on the board made a Be Quiet cooler, a $50 Be Quiet cooler, operate at about 100C with the CPU. Now, further investigation revealed that it was less of an issue with KB Lake and more of an issue with the motherboard, which is what we'll talk about in our motherboard reviews this week. The board was pushing voltages as high as 1.4 volts at times, which is wholly unnecessary. The MSI motherboard, meanwhile, produced an auto-configured voltage of about 1.28 to 1.32 volts, with a corresponding temperature range of 80 to 82 C max, about 10 C lower. This is with a package power that's reduced around 27 watts from gigabytes, but with exactly the same frequency performance. We then dropped the Gigabyte board down to 1.275 volts manually, giving it a range of 1.188 to 1.275 volts, as controlled by the motherboard, though with our manual guidelines. This brought temperature down from 94C with the auto out-of-box configuration. This is straight from the factory, although with an updated BIOS prior to release. And it brought it down from 94C to a 70C max. Massive difference. The next question is whether this is any better or worse than the previous generation, and so enters the 6700K. With the same setup, same configuration, same frequency, all of that stuff, and using the MSI Gaming M7 motherboard with a Z170 chipset, the 6700K is producing a temperature of about 72C on the package with the auto V core out of box and the V-Core was about 1.32 with this configuration. This is already cooler than the comparable MSI Gaming Pro Carbon benchmarks, despite running a higher reported wattage. In fact, when custom tuning the 6700K to operate at exactly the same voltage as our manually tuned 7700K, we're seeing a difference of approximately 6 to 7 Celsius. This is potentially because the 7700K samples we have, two of them, are having trouble transferring heat to the IHS, which of course would mean that your liquid cooler is less effective, but it'll require more testing to validate. Now, one thing, keep in mind that a lot of this is on the motherboard vendor, and that's something we'll talk about more, but basically you should check your voltages when you buy boards for this platform because it will drastically impact your temperatures. Aside from thermals, the Blender benchmarks were some of the most exciting to conduct. Our resident video producer and 3D animator Andrew Coleman built a custom Blender scene for GN's render benchmarks, and it's got a mix of motion blur, different materials and material properties, and ray tracing, things like that, so it's not an easy scene to render. Relying on the CPU for crunching the scene, the Intel i7 lineup dating back to Sandy Bridge, though skipping Ivy Bridge, shows the march of progress from 2011 to 2017. We see significant scaling compared to 2011's i7 2600K CPU, resulting in render time differences of upwards of 32 minutes. If it's your job to render animations and you're using an older CPU to do so, it's probably time to upgrade to nearly anything else. Of course, this is ignoring the fact that CUDA and OpenCL exist. Skipping Ivy Bridge, we see the Devil's Canyon 4790K rendering the same scene in about 49 minutes. This is improved upon by the 6700K Skylake CPU, which does the work in about 45 to 46 minutes. And that's an improvement of around 3 minutes per frame from Devil's Canyon to Skylake. Moving to the 7700K at its stock clocks, that time is cut another 3 minutes to 42.23 seconds, or about 7% shorter in total render time. This scaling has been fairly linear for three generations now, obviously with a big jump between the Sandy Bridge CPU and what follows. Out of curiosity, we ran the same render benchmark with hyperthreading disabled on the 7700K, 
resulting in a render completion time of 60 minutes, worse than the 4790K. Blender takes advantage of the additional threads here and is a real-world demonstration of what gamers often miss out on, which is job management engines that more properly task out all the threads in the system. Overclocking the 7700K to 5.1 GHz, which is trivial work on this platform, speeds up our render times by an additional 3 minutes over the stock configuration. Cinebench is the next in our line of tests. This one is a synthetic benchmark, but is similar in its objective to our custom-made Blender animation. It's still rendering. It uses more universal scoring, though, that allows for better comparison between hardware. We're seeing a performance output of 988 points using the full stock configuration of the 7700K with hyper-threading. A single core receives a score of 196 for an MP ratio of 5.05. Disabling hyper-threading drops us pretty heavily, down to 767 points, and a fairly trivial overclock to 5.1 GHz with hyper-threading enabled and a 1.37 V-core on the MSI Gaming Pro Carbon results in an 1122 CPU score. The single core performance for this same overclock is at 222 and the MP ratio remains 5.05. Last generation 6700K performs at 941 points or 185 single core. The 4790K, two generations old, receives 898 points or 180 for single core performance. Finally, the Sandy Bridge i7-2600K receives a 622 score with a 130 point score for single core performance. We're moving on to 3 d Mark next, another synthetic test, and then we'll get into game benchmarks. 3 d Mark tests use the new TimeSpy and the 1080p version of Firestrike. Just a quick note here, 3 d Mark results do have some variance in them. We see as much as 50 points of variance from one pass to the next, so this system gets more accurate as the performance between two devices gets farther apart. The stack up is about what you'd expect. Based on previous tests, the stock 7700K receives a score of 18,685 points with a physics score entirely CPU based and probably the most important at 14,478 points. Overclocking the 7700K to 5.1 gigahertz results in a score of 19,518 points or 16,431 for physics benchmarking. So to recap the two important numbers here, 14,478 for the stock 7700K physics score and 16,431 when using the overclocked version. To put some perspective in the benchmarks, we can speak strictly to the synthetic test performance improvement, and that's approximately 13% in the physics testing, or 4.5% of the total score. The 6700K posts a score of 13,648 for physics, or about 5.7% slower than the 7700K at stock clocks. In real-world terms, the physics performance of the 7700K posts an FPS of about 46, with the overclocked version at 52, and the 6700K at 43 FPS. This is, of course, ignoring things like frame times, which we'll get into with the game benchmarks. 4790K is at 40 FPS. And moving on to TimeSpy, our CPU score is 5852 on the stock 7700K, or 6370 when overclocked to 5.1. The 6700K rests at 5509 points and the 4790K at 4858 and then the 2600K is at 3242 points. So we can see some of the disparity but need more perspective from games to get a better idea. So that's enough synthetic testing for now. Blender gave us a real world look at performance for rendering and now we need one for gaming. The main way to do CPU tests for gaming workloads is to run game benchmarks that are more CPU bound rather than GPU bound of course because you want to root out those differences. However, because so many games are mixed workload or GPU heavy, we've thrown a couple of those in here as well, like Watch Dogs 2, just to give a better, more realistic idea of how a high-end single GPU will scale or limit its scaling when working with even an i5 and an i7 based on how the game is optimized. But of course, we've got the CPU heavy stuff as well, just for a more hard numbers look at the differences. Battlefield 1 has received several patches since our initial Battlefield 1 CPU benchmark, and we're also using new components for the testing, so the numbers are not comparable. Using DirectX 11 only here, because DX12 still has some problems in BF1, we're testing our suite of i7 CPUs with 1080p ultra settings and a 96 degree horizontal FOV. With these settings, we're seeing the 7700K KB Lake CPU operate at 141 FPS average stock with the GTX 1080 FTW, followed by 115 FPS 1% 1 lows and 104 FPS 0.1% lows. Overall, the CPU allows for consistent frame times at the low end while enabling the 1080 FTW to operate effectively to its full potential. Disabling hyper-threading keeps our average the same but brings the frame times down measurably. The 1% lows are now 102, 0.1% now 84, and then the 6700K pushes 140.7 FPS average effectively the same, with lows at 105 and 87. 
No perceptible difference here, but certainly a measurable one, and more CPU-bound games will help illustrate the differences further, in theory. To compare to a popular CPU from two generations ago, the 4790K operates at around 140 FPS average, 107 FPS 1% lows, and 94 0.1% lows. The marginally improved frame times are slightly a result of higher turbo clocks, and this is something we saw in our initial 6700K review as well. You can check that out if you're curious about why it's happening. Our 2600K instantly eats performance and creates a CPU bind where it was previously more of a GPU bind. We're at 118 FPS average, 78 1% lows, and 65 0.1% lows. Ashes of the Singularity has a built-in CPU benchmark when operating DirectX 12 and provides more of a CPU-centric look at performance. With 1080p high settings and full resolution textures, we're seeing a performance throughput of 41.5 FPS average, 33 1% lows, and 31 0.1% lows. Disabling hyperthreading, which is obviously not something this is really built for, brings us down nearly 10 FPS in averages. Overclocked, we don't get much additional performance, certainly not a noticeable amount. The 6700K at stock settings operates about 1 FPS slower than the 7700K, about 3% slower in percentages if you prefer, and the 4790K pushes a 36 FPS average with about a 5 FPS reduction in low frame rate. The 2600K puts things into perspective a bit better, approaching 2 times slower than the overclocked 7700K. Moving on to GTA 5, the chart is expectedly topped by the OC'd 7700K at 151 FPS average with lows sustained near 100 FPS. There's a few FPS reduction in performance to the stock 7700K with nearly equal performance from the 6700K with this configuration. The 4790K posts a drop of about 7 to 8 FPS from the 7700K or 5.2% slower in averages. The 2600K pulls our GPU performance down quite a bit to 104 FPS average with 0.1% low values now at 65 FPS. Nearly a 50 FPS reduction in performance thanks to 2011's Sandy Bridge. Our second to last title is Metro Last Light, just for something a bit known and because we've seen reasonable differences in CPU performance in the past. We're seeing an average FPS of 145 on the KB Lake KSQ CPU with stock settings with lows at 108 FPS and 101 FPS. Disabling hyperthreading, as we've always seen with Metro Last Light, kills performance, but it's also not a standard use of an i7, and it's probably not developed for. Moving to the 6700K, we see about a 2% reduction from the 7700K's results. The 4790K falls to about 137 FPS average, that's a performance loss of about 6% from the 7700K. And the 2600K drags it all down to about 111 FPS average with lows now in the 70s. Watch Dogs 2 provides a look at a modern mixed workload title. The game has some scaling between CPUs, but is also pretty abusive on the GPU. This means that you're getting a fuller picture at gain limits when changing CPUs as dictated by the games themselves, but also seeing that a multi-generational jump will still greatly improve performance. That's shown most obviously when referencing the i7-2600K CPU numbers, where we see an average FPS of 74 with lows at 54 and 48. Even just skipping Ivy Bridge and jumping to Devil's Canyon, we see more than a 20 FPS gain. Jumping another generation, we land on the 6700K's 110 FPS average with lows at 83 and 67 FPS 0.1% lows. The 7700K stock CPU provides performance throughput of 112.7 FPS average with lows at about 88 and 76. This gain isn't something you'll notice as a user between the 6700 and 7700K CPUs, but it's noteworthy nonetheless. We're still looking at a jaunt of about 2.5% before either hitting other barriers or running out of the overhead provided by the higher clock rate. Overclocking gets us another 1 FPS or thereabouts, but that's it. In the immediate future, once CES is over, and that's this week, we'll be revisiting the i5, the i3, and adding FX and Zen CPUs to the benchmark, so definitely stay tuned for that. And we're hoping to add a few more games as well, like Total War, which is absolutely CPU bound. That'll be in there for those benchmarks and maybe some more unique things as we roll. But for now, Blender and these games have us covered for the 7700K, which proves to be an incredibly easy overclocker. That much is for sure. It's hitting 5.1 gigahertz easily on the Gaming Pro Carbon with about a 1.37 voltage if you let it auto control, but I could definitely get it lower at least a bit by doing manual control. And we'll have more info on that in the motherboard reviews, which are going live today and later this week. Performance overall lands us around where we'd expect from a new generation i7 out of Intel, and that's a couple percent in games, meaning that owners of last generation, the 6700K, should probably just stick with that. Intel Crosspoint, Optane, and H.265 support are certainly value adds with the new platforms, but unless you have a hard need for one of those or the small improvements we've shown, it's best for the 6700K owners and maybe even 4790K owners to stick with what they've got.
Thermals are certainly a huge challenge for the KB Lake 7700K CPU. You'll want to check the motherboards that you buy to make sure that BIOS isn't unnecessarily blasting voltage to the CPU, like the Gigabyte board we tested, which was pushing 1.3 to 1.4 volts just with the stock configuration. Totally unnecessary. That was with auto voltage out of the box. The age of the Hyper 212 for something like an i7 as a lazy cooler when not overclocking is also over. The k SKUs we tested, two of them, even with voltages around 1.18 on the MSI board, were still hitting around 70C with a Kraken X62 280mm liquid cooler. And that's with the turbo clock fixed to 4.5 gigahertz, so we were operating at that clock rate for the duration of the test. It was a heavy workload test, yes, but these CPUs are definitely hotter than previous ones. And if you're planning to be an i7 owner, it's probably time to move on from the $20 CPU coolers and at least get something that's a little bit better. But again, there's a lot more thermal discussion in the article link in the description below. So if you want to see how it performs in, say, Blender benchmarking, which is a bit different than Prime 95 with large FFTs, you can find that in the article, and that'll give more of a real-world look at a high workload scenario for temperature performance. And the sort of end all here is the same as with most of our Intel flagship reviews for the last two generations now, which is basically if you've got the previous generation or even the generation before that, in the case, in this case, that'd be the 4790K, the 6700K, it's not really worth upgrading unless you need one of those features that was previously mentioned, like Optane support, Crosspoint, things like that, or you really want something fun to overclock because the 7700K is a damn good overclocker, but not everyone wants it for that reason. For anyone on older generations, Sandy Bridge especially, Ivy Bridge, although it wasn't tested, would fall between Sandy and Haswell architectures that we did test so we can extrapolate the performance. Anyone using those two sort of bridge platforms would probably do well to upgrade at some point, whether that's to a 7700K or Zen. Of course, we'll have to wait until we benchmark Zen. But for now, the 7700K is a big gain over Sandy Bridge, the 2600K. That much is for sure. For gaming, that is especially true. But if you're looking at something more recent, then gaming benchmarks are only giving a couple percentage points in performance improvement before running into either other walls or just running out of the headroom provided by the higher clock rate on this CPU versus the 6700K, which is again a couple hundred megahertz. So that is all for this review. As always, Patreon link in the post roll video to help us out directly. Links in the description below for more information if you want to read the review with additional info on thermal benchmarks and other things. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.